In the last video, we proved the following theorem. We showed that if R is a ring and S is a subring of R, then the cardinality of the left coset A plus S is the same as the cardinality of the subring S uh, for all elements of the ring R. In this video, we're going to actually investigate the consequences of this particular theorem, and we're going to wind up with an important result, which will be called Lagrange's theorem. But I want to start by asking, what does this really mean? So I want to also recall something else from an earlier video. And let's see, let's clean up my writing there. So I also want to recall from an earlier video that if I let F be the family of left cosets for this particular subring, then the family of left cosets is a partition of the ring R. And um, our big theorem now says every element, so every set inside our family of left cosets, has the same cardinality. Now, uh, what I want to remember is that a partition means something special as well. Uh, what we know is that we know that R is the union over all elements of R of the left coset A plus S, and we know that A plus S intersect B plus S is empty, or A plus S and B plus S are exactly the same set for all choices of A and B inside our ring. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to think about what goes on in the finite case. So we're now going to let R be a finite ring. And in particular, I'm going to let the cardinality of R be equal to N. Now, uh, S is a subring of R, and hence it is a subset of R. So that's going to imply that S is finite. And so I'm going to let the cardinality of S be equal to K. And what I want to look at is whether or not there is some relationship between the cardinality of R and the cardinality of S. So what I want to notice is this. We can think about this schematically, first of all. We can think about R as being this particular set. And what I do know is that there are in things inside that set. Now, I also know that S is a subring, so we can think about S being over here. And the cardinality of S is equal to K. So what that means is that there are K elements in this yellow subset of R. Now, I do know that the uh, left cosets of S partition R. What does that really mean? Well, what that means is that we can chop R up into a certain number of equal-sized pieces, and each one of these equal-sized pieces is a left coset. And I'm going to, in this particular picture, just think of it as A1 times S, rather A1 plus S, A2 plus S, A3 plus S, A4 plus S, A5 plus S. In this case, I would have five left cosets plus this one here, this would be 0 plus s. So there's a total of six left cosets. Of my subring s. And in this particular schematic, um, we know that each one of these cosets has exactly the same number of elements as the subring. 
So they all have K elements, and it's pretty clear that in this particular figure that the number of things inside the ring would have to be the number of cosets times the size of the subring. Now the question is whether or not this fact holds in general. So does this always work? In other words, I want to state this as a formal conjecture and think about what we might do to kind of try and investigate this. So we're going to let R have n elements. We're going to let our subring have k elements. And we're going to suppose there are exactly q distinct left cosets of my ring R inside, I'm of, let's clean that up because I misspoke there. We're going to suppose that there are exactly Q left cosets of S inside the ring R. In other words, what we've got is this idea. We can think about the, the distinct left cosets of s as. Well, our first one is going to be 0 plus s. Our second one I'm going to call a2 plus s. And then we've got a3 plus s. And we have all the way up to a q plus s. And we can think about 0 as being a1. And the point here is that if b is any element of r, then b plus s is equal to a i plus s for one of the a i's on my list of a1, which is 0, a2, a3, all the way up to a q. So these are the only left cosets. And let me actually put that in a box. These are the only left cosets of S. Now when I think about that, what that really means is the following idea. I already know that R is the union over all of the, I'm going to change this to B's, so all of the B's inside the ring of the left coset B plus S. But as we've already seen, there are only going to be a finite number of those left cosets because everything in sight is finite. So this turns out to be A1 plus S, union A2 plus S, union A3 plus S, all the way down to where we get down to unioning a q plus s. And I know that this is true since for every b inside my ring, b plus s is equal to a i plus s for some i between 1 and q. And again, uh, just to point things out, remember that we're thinking about a 1 as being equal to 0. Now the big theorem from the previous video says that we also know this. So we know that the cardinality of a i plus s is the same thing as the cardinality of s, which is exactly equal to k. Moreover, we also know that the distinct left cosets form a partition so we know that a i plus s intersect a j plus s is empty for i not equal to j. And that is very, very important because what this means is that when we look back 
at this particular way of writing R, we can figure out the number of things in R by simply adding together the number of things inside each one of our sets in the union. In other words, what I want to do is I want to come back down here and say this. Because of this very important fact, we can say that the number of things in R is going to be the number of things in A1 plus S plus the number of things in A2 plus S plus all the way down to plus the number of things in our last one, which was AQ plus S. But remember, these are all equal to K. And so what we've got here is that the number of things in R is going to be k plus k plus all the way down to k, and there are q k's in the sum. In other words, the number of things in R is equal to q times k, and uh, what I want to remember is that k was equal to the number of things in the subring, so the number of things in R is equal to q times the number of things in the subring. And this particular result that we've just got done proving can be stated in a number of different ways, but it is always given the name Lagrange's theorem. And so what I want to do to tie this video up is to state the theorem that we've just proved. So we have proved Lagrange's theorem. And Lagrange's theorem states the following. Let R be a finite ring. Let S be a subring of R. Then the number of things in R is equal to Q times the number of things in S, where Q is equal to the number of distinct cosets of S inside the ring R. Now, to tie things up very nicely, uh, the number of distinct cosets is usually called the index. So uh, we usually call the number of distinct cosets of subring R the index of S inside R, and the index is usually written as R colon S. So Lagrange's theorem can be restated as the number of things in R is equal to the index times the number of things in S.